the Alpine Path, the story of my career, by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 2 I was brought up by my grandparents in the old McNeil homestead in Cavendish. Cavendish is a farming settlement on the north shore of Prince Edward Island. It was 11 miles from a railway and 24 miles from the nearest town. It was settled in 1700 by three Scotch families, the McNeils, Simpsons, and Clarks. These families had intermarried to such an extent that it was necessary to be born or bred in Cavendish in order to know whom it was safe to criticize. I heard Aunt Mary Lawson once naively admit that the McNeils and Simpsons always considered themselves a little better than the common run. And there was a certain rather ill-natured local saying which was always being cast up to us of the clans by outsiders. From the conceit of the Simpsons, the pride of the McNeils, and the vain glory of the Clarks, good Lord deliver us. Whatever were their faults, they were loyal, clannish, upright, God-fearing folk, inheriting traditions of faith and simplicity and aspiration. I spent my childhood and girlhood in an old-fashioned Cavendish farmhouse, surrounded by apple orchards. The first six years of my life are hazy in recollection. Here and there, a memory picture stands out in vivid colors. One of these was the wonderful moment when, I fondly supposed, I discovered the exact locality of heaven. One Sunday, when I could not have been more than four years old, I was in the old Clifton Church with Aunt Emily. I heard the minister say something about heaven, that strange, mysterious place, about which my only definite idea was that it was where Mother had gone. Where is heaven? I whispered to Aunt Emily, although I knew well that whispering in church was an unpardonable sin. Aunt Emily did not commit it. Silently, gravely, she pointed upward. With the literal and implicit belief of childhood, I took it for granted that this meant that portion of Clifton Church which was above the ceiling. There was a little square hole in the ceiling. Why could we not go up through it and see Mother? This was a great puzzle to me. I resolved that when I grew bigger, I would go to Clifton and find some means of getting up into heaven and finding Mother. This belief and hope was a great, though secret, comfort to me for several years. Heaven was no remote, unattainable place, some brilliant but distant shore. No, no, it was only ten miles away, in the attic of Clifton Church. Very, very sadly and slowly, I surrendered that belief. Hood wrote, in his charming I Remember, that he was farther off from heaven than when he was a boy. To me, too, the world seemed a colder, lonelier place when age and experience at length forced upon my reluctant seven-year-old consciousness the despairing conviction that heaven was not so near me as I had dreamed. Mayhap, t'was even nearer, nearer than breathing, closer than hands or feet. But the ideas of childhood are necessarily very concrete. And when I once accepted the fact that the gates of pearl and streets of gold were not in the attic of Clifton Church, I felt as though they might as well be beyond the farthest star. Many of those early memories are connected with visits to Grandfather Montgomery's farm at Park Corner. He and his family lived in the old house then, a most quaint and delightful old place as I remember it, full of cupboards and nooks and little unexpected flights of stairs. It was there, when I was about five years old, that I had the only serious illness of my life, an attack of typhoid fever. The night before I took ill, I was out in the kitchen with the servants, feeling as well as usual, wide awake and full of ginger, as the old cook used to declare. I was sitting before the stove, and cook was riddling the fire with a long straight bar of iron used for that purpose. She laid it down on the hearth and I promptly caught it up, intending to do some riddling myself, an occupation I much liked, loving to see the glowing red embers fall down on the black ashes. Alas, I picked the poker up by the wrong end. As a result, my hand was terribly burned. It was my first initiation into physical pain, at least the first one of which I have any recollection. I suffered horribly and cried bitterly. Yet, I took considerable satisfaction out of the commotion I had caused. For the time being, I was splendidly, satisfyingly important. Grandfather scolded the poor distracted cook. Father entreated that something be done for me. 
frenzied folk ran about suggesting and applying a score of different remedies. Finally, I cried myself to sleep, holding my hand and arm to the elbow in a pail of ice-cold water, the only thing that gave me any relief. I awoke next morning with a violent headache that grew worse as the day advanced. In a few days, the doctor pronounced my illness to be typhoid fever. I did not know how long I was ill, but several times I was very low, and nobody thought I could possibly recover. Grandmother McNeil was sent for at the beginning of my illness. I was so delighted to see her that the excitement increased my fever to an alarming pitch, and after she had gone out, father, thinking to calm me, told me that she had gone home. He meant well, but it was an unfortunate statement. I believed it implicitly, too implicitly. When grandmother came in again, I could not be convinced that it was she. No, she had gone home. Consequently, this woman must be Mrs. Murphy, a woman who worked at grandfather's frequently and who was tall and thin like grandmother. I did not like Mrs. Murphy, and I flatly refused to have her near me at all. Nothing could convince me that it was grandmother. This was put down to delirium, but I did not think it was. I was quite conscious at the time. It was rather the fixed impression made on my mind, in its weak state, by what father had told me. Grandmother had gone home, I reasoned. Hence, she could not be there. Therefore, the woman who looked like her must be someone else. It was not until I was able to sit up that I got over this delusion. One evening, it simply dawned on me that it really was grandmother. I was so happy and could not bear to be out of her arms. I kept stroking her face constantly and saying in amazement and delight, Why, you're not Mrs. Murphy after all. You are Grandma. Typhoid fever patients were not dieted so strictly during convalescence in those days as they are now. I remember one day, long before I was able to sit up, and only a short time after the fever had left me, that my dinner consisted of fried sausages, rich, pungent, savory, homemade sausages, such as are never found in these degenerate days. It was the first day that I had felt hungry, and I ate ravenously. Of course, by all the rules of the game, those sausages should have killed me, and so cut short that career of which I am writing. But they did not. These things are fated. I am sure that nothing short of predestination saved me from the consequences of those sausages. Two incidents of the following summer stand out in my memory, probably because they were so keenly and so understandably bitter. One day I heard Grandmother reading from a newspaper an item to the effect that the end of the world was to come the following Sunday. At that time, I had a most absolute and piteous belief in everything that was printed. Whatever was in a newspaper must be true. I have lost this touching faith, I regret to say and life is the poorer by the absence of many thrills of delight and horror. From the time I heard that awesome prediction, until Sunday was over, I lived in an agony of terror and dread. The grown-up folk laughed at me and refused to take my question seriously. Now, I was almost as much afraid of being laughed at as of the Judgment Day. But all through the Saturday before that fateful Sunday, I vexed Aunt Emily to distraction by repeatedly asking her if we should go to Sunday school the next afternoon. Her assurance that, of course we should go, was a considerable comfort to me. If she really expected that there would be Sunday school, she could not believe that the next day would see the end of the world. But then, it had been printed. That night was a time of intense wretchedness for me. Sleep was entirely out of the question. Might I not hear the last trump at any moment? I can laugh at it now, anyone would laugh, but it was real torture to a credulous child, just as real as any mental agony in afterlife. Sunday was even more interminable than Sundays usually were then, but it came to an end at last, and as its dark descending sun dimpled the purple skyline of the gulf, I drew a long breath of relief. The beautiful green world of blossom and sunshine had not been burned up. It was going to last for a while longer. But I never forgot the suffering of that Sunday. 
Many years later, I used the incident as the foundation of the chapter The Judgment Sunday in The Story Girl. But the children of King Orchard had the sustaining companionship of each other. I had trodden the wine press alone. The other incident was much more trifling. The Martin Forbes of The Story Girl had his prototype in an old man who visited at my grandfather's for a week. Forbes was not his name, of course. He was, I believe, an amiable, respectable, and respected old gentleman. But he won my undying hatred by calling me Johnny every time he spoke to me. How I raged at him! It seemed to me a most deadly and unforgivable insult. My anger amused him hugely and incited him to persist in using the objectionable name. I could have torn that man in pieces had I had the power. When he went away, I refused to shake hands with him, whereupon he laughed uproariously and said, Oh well, I won't call you Johnny anymore. After this, I'll call you Sammy, which was, of course, adding fuel to the fire. For years, I couldn't hear that man's name without a sense of hot anger. Fully five years afterward, when I was ten, I remember writing this in my diary. Mr. James Forbes is dead. He is the brother of a horrid man in Summerside who called me Johnny. I never saw poor old Mr. Forbes again, so I never had to endure the indignity of being called Sammy. He is now dead himself, and I dare say the fact that he called me Johnny was not brought up in judgment against him. Yet, he may have committed what might be considered far greater sins that yet would not inflict on anyone a tithe of the humiliation which his teasing inflicted on a child's sensitive mind. The experience taught me one lesson at least. I never tease a child. If I had any tendency to do so, I should certainly be prevented by the still keen recollection of what I suffered at Mr. Ford's hands. To him, it was merely the fun of teasing a touchy child. To me, it was the poison of asps. End of chapter two.